welcome everybody um, to the sixth Meet and Learn session, which is organized by the SURE Eurodelta. The SURE Eurodelta is a working group of the European Network of Metropolitan Areas called METREX. I am Dagmar Keim. I work at the City of Amsterdam at the Department of Urban Planning and Sustainability. And we are currently chairing the SURE working group. And um, what is this working group doing? We are exploring how we can solve the big challenges that we as cities and regions are facing by sharing knowledge with each other and to see if collaboration can, on the scale of the right most data, can help to accelerate the solutions to find better solutions for our challenges. Currently, we are focusing on the acceleration of the circular transition in the built environment. And this is why we are having a, a series of lectures this year about the theme. And we are very happy that we just heard that we got um, an interreg proposal approved that we submitted. And uh, this will strengthen our collaboration a lot and will also make sure that we can continue these meet and learn sessions. Well, today I am very happy that I have Martin van Teil as guest speaker, together with Bas Forsting. Uh, Martin, you work at the Temp Architecture Urbanism, and you just recently published the book, The Flexible City, together with Tom Bergfoot. Um, in this book, you search for solutions for a circular and climate adaptive Europe. Well, you said it's a handbook for city planners, architects, and really makers, city makers, to come up with practical solutions how to make the cities circular and climate adaptive. Because our theme is currently circularity, we ask you to focus especially on circular examples, but also on work that is happening in the Euro Delta. But of course, since we're a Delta, not to forget the water as well. Um, but before I give Martin the floor, I would like to ask Bas um, to tell us a little bit about what the city of Amsterdam is doing since we commissioned the book, why we commissioned, uh, why we participated in this book, and how the book is actually helping us. Um, just one remark, as we all noticed, we already accepted that this uh, session will be recorded. And we will publish it afterwards on the website of the Shure Eurodata. So if you don't want to be in the picture, please don't turn on the camera off. Um, we decided that it's maybe the easiest to have a discussion after the presentation of Martin. And then we would like you to put your questions into the chat so when we can pick them up. And maybe later during the session, it's also possible to raise a hand. But uh, let's see how this works. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bas, you want to take over? Yes, thank you, uh, Dagmar, and uh, welcome to everybody. I will uh, share my screen. And I will just give a very short, brief presentation uh, because I think uh, Martin, uh, uh, Martin's story is so important. He should uh, take up most of the time. Uh, my name is uh, Bas Horsting. I am an uh, advisor on sustainable urban development. Oh, let's go to the beginning. For the city uh, of, uh, of Amsterdam. I work in the, in the planning department of the city of Amsterdam. And uh, in Amsterdam, we have a couple of sustainability goals. Um, uh, one of them is reducing the, the CO2 emissions. It's reduction by 5% in 2025. 60% 2030 and 95 by 2050. I see I have a wrong uh, number there. Uh, but there's also a resource strategy that we want to use 50% um, less primary abiotic resources to have a uh, fully circular, circular economy by 2050. And um, the way we have um, translated our aims is through our structure plan 2050. It's called a um, uh, human, uh, humane metropolis and uh, also a sustainable metropolis. So we, we've laid out uh, the instruments and, uh, and the plan to achieve that. And we've done so um, through a very integral approach to city making. 
And there's two instruments that I think are very important there. Uh, one is we have an integral um, way of designing all the underground and the public space. Uh, uh, the instrument there is the integral design method of public space. Um, and we also have a circular framework um, uh, for, uh, for urban development, uh, which is also very much an ecosystem approach. And we are now developing these two approaches to make a sustainable city. And I'm just going to show um, um, just a couple of examples. One is for climate adaptation. Um, in a neighborhood in the south of Amsterdam, we um, have made the entire neighborhood uh, rainproof. So here, the, the renewal of pipes and cables in the, in the infrastructure has been uh, combined with making a climate and a rainproof uh, um, street. And that has now been uh, delivered. So this project is, is now uh, almost finished. And uh, on the other aspect is uh, climate mitigation. Um, we approach building um, from a circular point of view. And we see now in the city of uh, Amsterdam a lot of examples where, for example, building with uh, bio-based materials, with reused materials is, is becoming more and more uh, prominent. And a couple of projects here are one of them is uh, Robin Wood. This is a sustainable uh, modular timber um, uh, housing project in, uh, in the Eiburg uh, region on the, in the east of Amsterdam. And another uh, project is the coffee fabric in the east of Amsterdam, for which uh, uh, a lot of reused materials, for example, in the facades are, are being um, uh, being used. Um, and now we are actually in the process of trying to scale up uh, what we do. And there's a lot of individual projects already uh, happening that are circular climate adaptive. But uh, we now need to scale up to uh, a neighborhood uh, level. And uh, here is the Nelson Mandela bird. It's 725 houses. We will make them all out of bio-based uh, materials. Um, that's just a few examples what we are doing. Uh, and this is actually my last slide. And then I would like to give the word to, uh, to Martin. So I would like to express that uh, in the city of Amsterdam, we really like to work together. Uh, we really like to work uh, to learn from the projects that are being developed in the city. Um, uh, we we use their input uh, for our structure plan. Uh, we look outside our uh, border re border regions. Um, so I think the Euro Delta region is in that sense really important. And uh, with uh, Martin and. And, and Tom, we also worked together on making the book. We only had a very small part in it, but I thought it was really nice to be able to reflect uh, on, the, on the content and to provide a couple of the instruments and uh, projects of our city to, uh, to Martin and to Tom, and also from them to learn through this book what is happening in the in the European region. So um, this is my short introduction, and I would like to give the word now to uh, to Martin. Thank you, Bas, for the for the kind introduction. Uh, in the meantime, I'm trying to share my screen to show the presentation. So, do you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So um, to start, um, I'm Martin van Taal. I'm one of the two authors of the book. Uh, I'll start with a bit on the background of the book so you can understand where it's coming from. Uh, both Tom and me are actually trained uh, as architects and urban uh, designers, and we also practice uh, architecture. And in our practice, we are more and more involved with projects that are either dealing with uh, climate adaptation. This is, for instance, a project we're currently working on in Amsterdam um, for two city blocks um, that have to be rainproof, uh, nature inclusive. And you see 80% of the facades have to be uh, uh, grown with uh, plants. Uh, all the Horizontal surfaces need to have a, a, a substrate, so plants can grow there. Um, 
to avoid hard surfaces. This is for this is an example of a, of a, a transformation we see in projects with more emphasis on this for good reason. Uh, and another um, focus we see in the in the practice is towards circularity, as Bas already mentioned in the in the building construction process. This is, for instance, a project we're doing of retrofitting a, a post-war social housing complex where we reuse uh, not only the building structure but also the prefabricated uh, concrete uh, facade tiles and and all the wood that was used in the in the project and while doing so the 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 the, the, the sustainability has is, is being upgraded from f which is in the netherlands one of the worst uh, energy labels towards a which is one of the the best so um, we noticed that that yeah more and more of these challenges need uh, 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 um, uh, trans uh, to translate into our practice. And be besides working on um, buildings and projects that are being realized, we also do a lot of research projects. This is, for instance, a project for a post-war area in Amsterdam, where we, with the municipality, looked for potential to in incorporate SMEs and business spaces within existing uh, city uh, structures. And um, have, because have Matrix is, of course, an international network, I think it's also interesting to mention that we also support uh, city networks. For instance, for uh, Urbect, we've worked on a collaboration between nine cities who are uh, transforming and upgrading their post-war urban areas. and by working together on projects like this, we noticed that in Europe, there's a lot of common issues, a lot of common challenges, uh, which probably you also are aware of because of the, 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 the matrix network that you're part of. And by sharing knowledge uh, about the different ways that in different city, cities and regions we are um, dealing with these challenges, there's a lot to be learned. And, this kind of led to three publications uh, of the Flexible City. Uh, and um, currently the, the, the third one has been released, which has a focus on circularity and climate adaptation. But the two previous ones had a, a different focus. Uh, the sec second one was more on um, uh, sustainability in a broader sense. And the first one, it was released during the last financial crisis was focusing on how to deal with vacant buildings and vacant uh, building sites. Um, this book that, that, that we, we is, has been currently published in collaboration with the municipality of Amsterdam has to focus on circularity as uh, climate mitigation, as Bas already uh, mentioned, and climate adaptation. And uh, yeah, I only have about 20 minutes uh, to, to give you a brief impression of the book. So we decided to focus mainly on circularity. Um, but uh, I will also show a couple of examples uh, relating to climate adaptation. And what is interesting, uh, the, the, there's a lot of things we have in common in Europe, but geological uh, um, uh, context and, and uh, the climate challenges are slightly different uh, across Europe, as you can see in, on, uh, in, in the map on the right. And therefore, we've not written this book uh, just by ourselves, but we uh, collaborated with uh, several reporters, actually most of them young graduates, professionals from across Europe. Uh, who helped us to define what are different challenges in specific regions and which instruments and uh, uh, best practices relating to these uh, challenges are worth sharing. Um, and in that sense, it is a, a bit a broad book uh, because if you think about it in the end, if you really want to uh, do something about uh, the, the climate change and, and the, 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 the increase of carbon emissions. Uh, the difficulty is that most things are related. So it is kind of a holistic approach. And that's why in our book, you can uh, find challenges so, such as soil pollution, 
related to the context in Poland, uh, carbon emissions to, to Luxembourg. Rainwater floods is the one we've collaborated on uh, with the municipality of Amsterdam, but also biodiversity decline. And what, what we've done is not only describe these challenges relating to specific city context or regional context, but also uh, collect um, instruments uh, that are being uh, used in these different contexts to do something about it. And uh, I already mentioned I'm a spatial designer, but of course I also know that the answer is not in just uh, making a beautiful or smart design. Um, it is also about the, uh, the finance, the, the, the legal context, context and the process. And that's why you can find um, instruments relating to these four categories in our uh, book. And these instruments are, are not only described um, by themselves, but they're also related to realized examples across Europe. Here you can see an overview of the examples that are included in the book. And for each um, realized project that is described, we describe a financial, a legal, an organizational and a spatial instrument that has been used uh, for this realized example. So that's a bit on the structure of the book. And what uh, is the starting point of our book is that uh, um, in Europe, we share a lot of things. We share a certain cultural history. Uh, we have more or less the same democratic principles. Uh, we are, of course, part of the European Union. And we're pretty old as, uh, as uh, um, uh, settlements. And that's why all these difficult challenges, uh, we are not facing them on some kind of tabula rasa condition, but we're facing them in uh, existing uh, urban tissues where there are already press a lot of different uh, stakeholders present and a lot of different uh, um, interests that have to be taken into account. And this makes planning um, quite challenging. Uh, and the the the... The, the, the starting point of our book is that this requires a different type of planning from, let's say, the modernistic way, the blueprint way, where a, a plan was made and projected on, uh, on a, 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 an area uh, and realized uh, a bit no matter what, uh, not taking into account that the future is quite unpredictable. And this is what this scheme uh, um, illustrates on the top let's say, the, the modernistic uh, way of planning. And at the bottom, a, a way that we're describing that's actually becoming more and more uh, common, uh, a way of planning that is more agile, that can deal with unpredictability or at least takes it into account and is thinking more smartly about adaptive structures, uh, different scenarios and how to uh, uh, anticipate them. Uh, so th this is, of course, just a scheme, um, but in the book, we, we also um, show um, projects or, 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 or ways to deal with certain challenges, and we try to illustrate what we mean. Eh? For instance, this is relating to the challenge of flooding, which is, um, of course, a very uh, uh, clear and present challenge in the Netherlands. And the idea is that as a first step, you create something, a structure that is adaptive. For instance, here we propose uh, an urban area which is built on top of a certain basement that has already water buffers integrated. And it's anticipating on two public levels, one public level at the moment, but also a back off plan of a higher public level that when things get worse than predicted, um, can can be taken into use and and this is a way of starting with an adaptive structure an adaptive plan that can deal with different scenarios of future so on, on the, the the right bottom let's say the the, the sea level rise and the, the the flooding of rivers is the worst scenario and on the top it's the most positive scenario and the thing with climate changes uh, is that in the end, nobody really knows 
what the situation will be in 20 or 30 years. We can also make only make certain uh, predictive uh, scenarios. So um, to, 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 to make examples and instruments a bit more specific related to climate adaptation, I thought it's nice to focus on rainwater floods. This is a map that is related to the challenge uh, for, for the city of Amsterdam, where there are certain regions uh, where, uh, because of the, 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 the levels are below uh, sea level, uh, rainwater is quite a problem. And one of these uh, uh, areas is actually a pro uh, an example that's described in the book that we've also worked on as an architect is the AMC hospital, which is the, the main hospital in the Netherlands. It was built uh, just in the periphery of the city, kind of freestanding. Uh, this is a, a picture of the, of the 70s or 80s when it was just realized. But recently, the city has moved up towards the to, to, to the hospital. There's a lot of big housing complexes surrounding it now, and it's not so isolated anymore. You can also see that in front of the hospital, there's only hard surfaces, uh, asphalt parking lots. Uh, and actually, this parking lot is one of the flooding areas that was indicated on the map, which is very problematic for the ambulances that have to, of course, um, um, uh, enter and, and exit from, from the hospital. So what, what we've worked on is a, is a project where the hard surfaces are uh, replaced by a more park-like condition. The parking is still there, uh, but it is uh, um, surrounded by wadis, uh, uh, penetrable uh, surfaces, so the water can go away. And it has an additional benefit that the hospital has a more of a, um, a park-like quality, both for the people who work there, the visitors, but also for the patients. There was actually no uh, meeting space there in the past. So this is an example that we've described. And one of the instruments that, that, that was used here is uh, soil sensitivity. Yeah, so this is then a page from the part in the book of chapter three that describes the instruments. And what is soil sensitivity is, is taking into account what is underneath uh, the ground. Yeah, because most of the time with planning, we just artificially project what we want on top of, the, of, of, of an area, not really taking into account that there's already an ecology there, that there's a certain soil condition there uh, that doesn't always go together so well with what's projected on the top. And in this case of the hospital, what is done is that this, this, this layer of asphalt that closes off the soil is mostly removed and uh, replaced by, um, uh, yeah, by plants and earth and making, uh, uh, again, an ecological connection. So th that's just one example of the many projects that are relating to climate adaptation in the book. Um, and now I would like to focus more on, on circularity, uh, the other topic of the book. And I've um, uh, made a, a distinction between three types of um, circular buildings, uh, because I, I mainly want to focus on, on the building process, on, uh, on construction. The first type being adaptive uh, buildings, the second bio-based buildings, and the third buildings out of waste. Well, what do I mean with that? I'll explain you later. Um, um, but circularity as climate mitigation, I think, is incredibly important. It's a way of reducing waste and, in that sense, uh, carbon emissions. It's, it's reducing waste by building smarter so that, in the end, we don't produce more waste. But it's also building smarter by using uh, waste materials and turning them upgrading them into um, materials that can be used for new uh, uh, products and constructions. Um, we've related that challenge to Copenhagen uh, because Copenhagen is one of the most ambitious cities with, when it comes to circularity because they already want to be uh, uh, CO2 neutral in 2025. So they have already invested quite a lot of uh, um, um, attention into circularity. To put circularity in 
into perspective, I think it's also good to mention that the most effective thing to do is actually to, to question and to rethink the demand. Yeah? Because by reducing the demand, yeah, if we use less stuff, I think that's in the first place the most effective way of reducing uh, carbon emissions. So I think that's why always the question should be, do we really need this? Do we really need one mil million more uh, apartments or, or, or housing complex, uh, housing units? If I think about the Dutch context, or could it be less somehow if we do things more smartly? The second most uh, effective thing is, I think, not to demolish things, not to de demolish building structures, but to see if you can reuse buildings that are already constructed. So you don't have to take them apart. Um, the CO2 emissions that were already done by constructing the, 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 the building in the first place are uh, are being used for a longer period of time. And so that's why one of the instruments in the book that's been described is a demolition ban, because we think it's really important uh, to, to, to think twice before throwing stuff away or demolishing structures that, that are already there. Um, then I go to the three categories, the first one being adaptive buildings. Um, adaptive buildings, if you think about circular buildings, are in a way maybe the easiest ones to, to, to realize because um, they can be constructed out of new um, materials. And what makes these buildings adaptive? It's, it's, in the, in the, in, um, it's actually two things. In the first place, it's uh, very um, uh, um, smart to, 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 to make adaptive uh, program neutral buildings, yeah, because maybe now we need a lot of housing, but in the future, this could be a different type of program. And not in order not to have to demolish, demolish these new buildings, it makes sense to make them already suitable for different type of uses and programs in the future. So that's one thing you can do with adaptive buildings. And the other thing is when you use um, dry knots uh, um, and, and uh, modularity for the construction, it means you can take the whole building apart without uh, having any waste and reconstruct the uh, elements into a new building. And this was done for the head office of the Triodos building uh, bank, which uh, you can see here uh, on the screen. Uh, each part of this building um, is constructed in such a way that it can be taken apart and reconstructed uh, somewhere else. And this, this, this is a, a, a process that requires an extra investment of time and administration. What was done at the Triodos Bank is that they've made a material passport in which all certifications and qualifications of the used materials are very precisely described so that when maybe over 50 or 60 or 100 years, when the building is maybe not longer needed, it can be taken apart and elements can be reused into a, a, a new building. So that's one way of thinking about um, uh, circularity. Another way of, of making uh, circular buildings, uh, which was also already mentioned by uh, Bas, is uh, bio-based buildings by using biological materials. Um, uh, uh, the, the CO2 footprint is, is drastically uh, reduced or sometimes even zero um, uh, because yeah, these materials are regrowable. Uh, and sometimes or often they also actually store CO2 instead of uh, em emitting them uh, during the production process. Uh, an example, um, an obvious example is uh, wood construction. This is a project in, in Finland where they're kind of, uh, 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 I would say ahead of us, at least when I'm talking about the Netherlands in the sense that they're already building quite tall uh, structures, like from up till nine, 10 stories, uh, solely in, uh, in timber. So this is a project uh, realized in Finland, 
where they used prefabricated modular CLT, that's cross laminated timber uh, structures, um, that are made in a workplace under super good conditions. On the building side, you only need a crane to 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 host uh, to to put the modules into place, reducing the construction time drastically um, by almost uh, six months for uh, an, uh, a building like this. Um, and this has a lot of advantages. And of course, Finland has uh, um, a lot of um, production forest. Um, so also these. This, this material is, is coming from around the corner in, in this case. So this is what it looks like then. So these three apartment buildings are all built in this way. Uh, and the instrument described is modular uh, building, um, which uh, I already explained, has the benefit of a, a very fast uh, and, and economic uh, construction on the side and also working indoors under ideal uh, circumstances to, to get a better product with less uh, waste material, uh, uh, which can all be prepared in a computer and, and engineered uh, uh, to precision. Another, and I think also a very inspiring uh, um, example of bio-based building is Atelier Luma in Arles. Uh, it's a former uh, a train uh, uh, um, manufacturing site uh, in the south of France, in the Camargue region. And what is interesting is that this structure uh, was first used as a laboratory to see, to test bioregional bio-based materials. They, the, 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 the project actually started by mapping what kind of production and, and, and um, uh, possible uh, source materials are there in the Camargue region. And they came up, for instance, with uh, um, um, uh, sunflowers uh, that are grown a lot in this uh, hot region. And th th they contacted the, the, the companies who do this and they asked, what kind of waste material do you have in your process that you cannot do anything with? And then they did research on these pits that that's some kind of course of the of the, of the sunflower that that cannot be used and they um, um, did research and they found out that it has a very good um, uh, uh, property as uh, acoustic insulation so they developed a, a, a material out of this waste product that can be used for ceilings that can be used as a wall um, and which was in the end also uh, incorporated in the transformation of this former uh, train uh, um, uh, um, plant in, in, in all. Other materials that were used are salt. Uh, there's a lot of salt uh, in the area. They've made tiles out of salt, doorknobs out of salt. Um, the region is also very known for its, its, its clay. So they used um, uh, adobe construction uh, for the building. And in this sense, 100% of, of, the, of the transformation was done with bio-based materials. And, and on top of that, they um, developed nine new and certified materials, not only for France, but also for Germany and England, that can also be used in, in different areas. So they see themselves as a testing laboratory for new for new bio-based materials um, that can be used um, on, a, on a larger scale. So as the instrument related to this and which is also described is bio-based building, a building with materials that are organic, renewable and mostly plant-based. Um, the third category of circular uh, buildings that I, I think is nice to um, tell you a bit about, and then uh, I'll, I'll give the floor for the discussion, is buildings uh, out of waste. And I already mentioned that uh, Denmark is kind of a forerunner when it comes to circularity. Uh, and this is a project that's um, it's called Resource Rose, which has been uh, built in uh, Copenhagen. And um, 
It's on a site uh, just outside of the center and nearby there was the Carlsberg factory that that um, was being demolished to make uh, way for a new uh, a housing plan. And what they've done is reuse all the bricks from the uh, original Carlsberg factory for a new housing project. And on top of that, they've also reused all the wood that was used to package building materials for the subway uh, uh, constructions nearby uh, to incorporate them as uh, other building materials in the projects. And the, the, the interesting thing is this is quite innovative and it also um, requires a deep understanding of materials in the, in the construction uh, processes that in the past bricks uh, were put together with mortar in, in a way that it was easy to take them apart. But now the mortar is so strong, it's actually stronger than the than the brick, is that you cannot separate single se separate single bricks. So what they've done is they cut out with a big saw panels of one and a half by one and a half meter. So the, the, the mortar is still in between. And as a patchwork, they, uh, they created a new facade out of these reused uh, bricks and reducing the CO2 emission for, uh, for, for, the, for the facade by 75% uh, in this way. And, it, and I, I already told you I'm a designer. In the end, I think it also um, has a certain arch new architectural quality, um, which interestingly is also related to the past because it was always quite the standard to reuse building materials. Think about the old Roman uh, uh, structures that were wh where parts of buildings were taken out and reused in Gothic uh, uh, constructions. And until not too long ago, it was quite common to take um, uh, building materials out of ruins, out of buildings that were not in use. Uh, so that's why reinterpretation of existing uh, uh, building structures is one of the instruments that is related to this uh, example in Copenhagen. And uh, I think the most distinctive one, and, and then I'll uh, 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 I stop my presentation, is the role that the architect played here, because they were not just the designers. They noticed that the developer and the contractor were quite, quite skeptical of this idea of reusing materials. So what they've done, they created an own company to demolish uh, and take out these brick panels from the existing buildings and to get them certified as materials that would be approved by the municipality to be used in a new building. So they kind of broadened their role as an architect. And interestingly, that this also gave an, an extra financial uh, um, input I think they, they got extra money because they they also played the role of the demolisher and uh, the building material product producer that they, they could use this extra money for this innovative uh, approach so just to illustrate that doing things out of the standard uh, often also requires a, a, a new a new interpretation of roles and of the ways things are done um, and by doing so, they upcycled, they, they, they gave a, a material with almost no value, the, the, the brick that was going to be demolished, and new value as a new construction material. Um, and I think this is the last slide I, I want to show, because I know there's also some of you from Germany. Um, this is a German uh, um, uh, example where on the right top in the black and white image, you can see a, an original town hall, uh, had a, the historical town hall on the right and in the left, uh, the modern addition that was done in the 50s, uh, a concrete structure that has absolutely no relation to this historical building and the historical village. Here on the left, you can see it's really a Fachwerkhaus um, uh, 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 a city. And what, what has been done is that all these materials were reused in a circular way and put together uh, again uh, in a new project 
for the for the town hall um, creating a uh, extension to this old town hall that does fit better in the historical context and this this was done by reusing uh, the original materials and reducing uh, waste uh, so this is also a very interesting um, circular uh, project in that sense and I know you, you probably have some questions but an, a question I would also think could be interesting to discuss uh, later on is uh, these are quite innovative and uh, um, uh, special projects that I showed you in instruments but if we really want to have an effect with circularity it, it is very important to to scale up to 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 to, to make this, these kind of approaches more common. And uh, yeah, I, I, I am quite curious how we can do this together. So this is maybe a question we could discuss later. And just to finish, I just show you a very brief uh, um, a few, a few into, the, of, into the book, but there's a lot more examples, especially related to climate adaptation um so if you're interesting you could check out the book uh, to find out more about it thank you well thank you very much martin uh there was a question from uh, ludovica i think i hope i say it right if this uh, is available on public on open research by any chance the pdf of the book no, no, it's it's not. It it has been developed uh, with many uh, uh, parts, and the Municipality of Amsterdam is one of them, but also the Ministry of Interior Affairs and the the publisher and I uh, publishers. So it's it's not uh, an open source uh, book at the moment. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And then there was another question from Hannah Kreblin. She asked if a demolition ban is something that has been introduced in any city or anywhere so far that's a good one no it's a it's a provocative uh, instrument that we've suggested as a good idea but it's it's not been implemented anywhere um and uh it's also good to put it into context uh because in former books we've also looked at demographically declining regions and and there oh, it doesn't all, it it doesn't make sense to put to 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 have a demolition ban because there hey, you you also need less building structures often okay i already saw a comment from uh, brussels capital region they said they're working on a changing of the building regulations in which they make demolition the exception and renovation the standards that's great that, so we that's... have a front runner maybe would be great to have that also in Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah. And well, are there else. more questions right now? So then I would like, yeah, maybe I, I, I ask you something, Martin, because uh, we talked beforehand about the initiative of the show Eurodata working together in this Delta region. And yep. uh, I ask you, what are the learnings you would like to give to us so, and what do you think about the idea of cooperation on the scale do you think it makes sense it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to start with your last question uh, recently we have had heavy rains not only in the netherlands but also in germany and and further up the rivers and the last decade i think the netherlands has worked on space for the rivers uh, the, 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 near the Biespols area where the delta where the rivers end there's dry land where dikes are being taken away uh, to create more space for this flooding uh, and and now actually for the first time in a lot of years these these areas are being used and this proves that that we're not uh, living into in isolated worlds eh? the, the rivers are very strong uh, uh, connectors big networks that 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 start high up the mountain and affect everything along the way so i think a, a network based on on a water structure makes perfect sense in seeing the the challenges we're facing at the moment yeah and we want to try to be circular yeah we're trying to work on a 
to see whether we can reduce actually as a amount of space and materials in our own regions by working together with different cities and come up with uh, smart strategies and smart uh, mobility plans. Do you have any uh, recommendations? Yeah, I, this is one of the reasons why I put the example in Arl in there, the Atelier Luma project. It's not, I mean, it's not, the scale is a little bit smaller than the scale that you're actually working on. But there they've also looked at the whole region, the whole Camargue region, seeing what happens at the sea, what 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 is being produced on the land, what are the needs in the city, and how can we in a sustainable way link these things together, avoiding waste, working with bio-based materials, but also creating jobs and opportunities um, along the way for the people who have uh, uh, yeah, uh, certain economic activities. Um, so it, it does make sense in many ways if you, if you think about circular, circular economies and, 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 and ways of producing to zoom out. And the Rotterdam Harbor is related to the Ruhr area. Uh, I mean, th these things are not, uh, they're all interconnected. So I think also by scaling up in this way, the, the, the circular approach can have a lot more effect than just looking at, looking at, at it at, uh, only at the municipality level. So I'm, I'm, I think it's great that you collaborate on that scale. Thank you. Are there more questions? Otherwise, yes. we, yeah. I have a question on the, on the scaling up, if I may, uh, uh, sure. uh, Dagmar, because I think the examples are great. Eh? And I also spoke to developers in the past. Uh, they made this great circular building, reused materials. And I asked them, OK, did you use a big database for this or some regulations? And they said, no, no, no. We just asked for students from a technical university to cycle around the city, literally going to construction sites, see what they can find. And they made a great building out of this. And so I was also wondering, and the, the approach you've shown us for Copenhagen, it's, 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 it's just dependent on coincidences. Somebody knows where these wooden panels are and knows someone who can work with it. How can we make these kinds of things um, uh, uh, scalable so that it's not dependent on people who know where to find stuff? Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. Uh, of course, uh, working with bio-based materials and, and working with on new circular uh, um, production materials is easier to scale up than using waste because you're always the supply and demand if you relate it to the logistic process of construction is very complicated you need to be sure you have the materials you need when you start constructing but the thing is that the Lendeker group that's the the the, the office who realized this resource uh, rose project they are very aware of this and they say we also only think circularity is interesting when you can scale it up um, so th they 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 look for um, uh, methods that do not only apply to that project and so they they they, they made a way to to certify yeah, because the, the problem is if, if you reuse old materials, you still have to fulfill all the new building codes and all the new regulations. And sometimes this is very hard to prove. Yeah? And, and then I'm not even talking about the, 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 the committee that looks at the spatial quality of the buildings, yeah? because you don't know what the building is gonna look like if you, if you use waste. But all these things they have tackled um, and um, they have, found ways to deal with them. So it, it is possible. And yes, it is also it is also challenging and complicated. This is true. <coughs> yeah, Alexandra. Uh, I would like to comment that uh, the French state has uh, implemented regulations that uh, force new buildings to have 20% uh, reused material. And what we see here in Brussels is an influx of French demolishers who are basically taking the materials to France because now there's a huge market and they're just uh, pulling out the resources. So uh, changing the regulation also has a huge impact. <laughs> That's true. And, and I, I mentioned uh, Denmark, but France is also one of the forerunners when it comes to circularity and bio-based uh, uh, construction. So yeah, that's 
interesting you pointed out. Um, but changing, of course, changing the, the, the regulations have a huge impact. And, and yeah, regulations are also not poured in concrete. So, but of course, it's more a policy thing. Uh, but th there are also opportunities there to, to, to do something about it. Bas, you raise your hand. Uh, yes, uh, I would also like to add something here. Also, what Jan is, Jan is saying on, uh, on where do you find the, the materials? And, and what I actually see in the book is quite nice. You already provide a couple of instruments that, that we can, uh, can combine. Here, there's the example of the resource rows in, uh, in Copenhagen, but you also have this um, uh, re uh, reused materials mediator from, from Belgium. And I think, for example, uh, something like that could work in Amsterdam quite well. At the moment, I'm trying to connect um, uh, people and uh, demolished buildings with new buildings, things like that. But I'm, for example, not not aware of all the companies that can actually uh, take them uh, apart or uh, cut them and, and and refit them. And also all the all the, all the legal requirements uh, I'm not aware of. So I can also imagine that uh, in, uh, in in different stages you have different instruments. So to start, it's 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 better to 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 uh, have this mediator um, as a role, and then when regulations um, come in, and uh, probably the upscaling will be happening on a different uh, different level. So and, that, and and that's what I think is really nice in the book that you provide some of these long term instruments and some of the uh, short term. And uh, I think the solution is, is is building a pathway that includes uh, both of them. I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you also see more and more of these web pages that appearing where they actually uh, they offer materials. Yeah. I think that's something currently happening a lot as well. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, so we didn't discuss your question, Martin, that you had yourself. Oh, well, part, uh, partly, I think Jan's question also has to do with that, as a, how, how can you scale up? How, how can this kind of exceptional, how can these exceptional projects become more mainstream? So that, that has to do with the things we were just discussing uh, that ask for new roles of, of new ways of providing building materials to the site, new ways of judging uh, by, by authorities of judging these um, building processes. Um, the, the, this is all related to scaling up. Yeah. Eric. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you also for, for a wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it. It was very comprehensive. So I, I think what we're saying to each other is, is uh, it's important to, to scale up, to go from exception to mainstream. It should be a standard to work in, in the circular way and an exception to demolish and, and completely uh, uh, build new constructions. And, and we mentioned, I think, in the discussion three, uh, interesting uh, pathways towards that, that goal. One is a, a form of standardization, industrial standardization, so that you as a builder and as a uh, consumer, you know, uh, uh, somebody who lives uh, in, in a house, have a certain certain guarantee that, that there is a, um, a judgeable uh, quality. It is not necessarily to be top quality, but it should be judgeable. And, and transparent, and I think that's that requires cooperation and harmonization uh, towards these these uh, regulations on an, on a higher level of scale than cities and metropolises. So I think it would be interesting to to try and investigate if we could come with some sort of a approach to to come to a standardized uh, way of working in in a in a larger area. So the Euro Delta may be an interesting hypothesis for that. And just the example we just heard from from Brussels, there is some sort of a, a transnational uh, market there. The second thing is is the how to find the right stuff. 
and I think in, in a way it's <clears throat> there are many examples that that go to that point because if you go on the internet you'll find websites where uh, secondhand building materials are simply you know offered and 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 uh, and uh, so so if we could take that to a next level because you, you don't have to uh, you know send send students uh, on the bicycle uh, to to drive around cities you you could simply you know open your laptop if if we could come with something like that 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 would allow us to to make really make a market without all this logistic you you could you could find that as well so that that's interesting but the most interesting part for me was the end of the pipeline so then we're b starting to build circular and bio based and modular wonderful and then we face the challenge of all these committees we have in in every country of aesthetical uh, evaluation and then at the end of the pipeline you know the answer may be no not good enough not not beautiful enough or <clears throat> so i think that's that requires some sort of a interdisciplinary uh, professional discussion so i think we we need a next generation of architects designers that that make also in an aesthetic way uh, circularity to mainstream so that we don't judge and value uh, areas uh, urban areas new new or re reconstructed urban areas or buildings we don't judge them by the by the, the quality standards the aesthetic standards of um, of the 1960s of the 1970s but we, you know, we, we also need a, a next generation aesthetics so I think that would be interesting to, to see if we can combine it with the new Bauhaus uh, uh, opportunities to come with a new sort of city aesthetic based on circularity, not only the construction of new buildings in an in a in a circular way, but if we take maintain maintenance of existing buildings as a starting point, that that does something for our our idea of city aesthetics. I think I think that would be interesting. That would be really interesting, because it also I think it's very inspiring to, you know, to work with students and 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 young architects to find out what kind of a new aesthetic they could could, uh, could put forward. So that that would my appeal be. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. Hey, it is time. We unfortunately have to stop this uh, discussion. Uh, every time when it really starts getting more and more into depth, this is how this works with this kind of webinars. I would like to thank everybody who came here and I would like to show also do a little bit of advertisement for the next webinar, uh, which will be um, from the Dutch uh, government, the agency of uh, spatial planning. Um, they, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Institute is going to give a lecture about research that they did on circularity and they did four scenarios where they looked at the Netherlands, how the Netherlands could look in 2050s and what is actually the spatial implementations that would occur if the Netherlands would become fully circular. So I think this is very it's interesting and will give a little bit of insight about what is happening here and hopefully inspires all of our sure members to come. So and if you like what we are doing, then please follow our LinkedIn web uh, LinkedIn site from the sure Euro Delta because we are always updating all upcoming events. And the next meeting is 15th of December because of Christmas. Usually we have it the last Friday of the month. OK, thank you very much, Martin, Bas, for coming, sharing your information. Thank you, everybody, for the questions and interesting insights. And have a nice day. Thanks, Thanks so for much. having me. Thank bye. You. Bye. bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. bye. Hey, Eric.